Once again, I'd like to welcome everyone to our webinar, Biobanking and Future Research, Addressing the Unknown in the Protocol and Consent. We are excited to be discussing this topic with you today. I'm Ari Burgess, Quorum's Director of Client Relations. This is the second of two webinars on this particular topic, and this is our first series in 2014. On that note, if you'd like to stay informed on Quorum initiatives such as our webinars, be sure to sign up for our mailing list. You can find the mail list by going to our website, www.quorumreview.com, and clicking on News and Events. The mail list sign up is in the upper right hand corner. This will ensure that you receive the latest e-news updates from Quorum, including Quorum's responses to FDA guidance, trends in clinical trial review, and our quarterly e-news publication, the Quorum Forum. Immediately following this webinar, we invite you to participate in a brief survey that will help us know what type of topics interest you. This does help us continue to offer webinars that are current and informative, so at the end of the webinar, please do take a few moments to complete the survey. I'll be giving you a brief overview of Quorum before introducing our presenter, but first off, I would like to cover a few housekeeping items. Questions and answers. Feel free to submit questions at any point during the webinar using the chat box on your webinar dashboard. The responses to the questions will be sent by our presenter following the webinar, typically within 30 days. The recording, the slide deck, and the attendance certificate will all be available and posted on our website within five business days. We'll be emailing you a link to the view the recording as soon as it's available. We'd like to encourage you to share this link with your staff and colleagues. I'd also like to remind you that this webinar is eligible for one hour or one point towards recertification of your CIP or ACRP credential. We will be emailing a certificate of attendance within one week. We'll be dispatching these only to the email addresses that signed up for and attended the webinar. And now I'd like to take a few moments before we get started to talk briefly about Quorum Review. Quorum Review is fully accredited with the Association for Accreditation of Human Research Protection Programs, or AHARP, through 2014. Quorum is compliant with both FDA and OHARP requirements. We have six in-house licensed attorneys that provide both in-house regulatory guidance and can frequently be found speaking at industry events providing thought leadership. Quorum has boards that are appropriately comprised to review studies in the United States, Canada, and now even beyond North America. Currently, Quorum is one of the largest central IRBs with over 180 employees, and of those that are of equivalent size, we are the only one that remain independent of venture capital ownership. Quorum is proud of the number of our employees that hold CIP certifications. This is certified IRB professionals. Currently, 60% of our affiliated IRB members, 40% of our regulatory staff, and 20% of our study managers and support positions hold this CIP certification. Quorum's turnaround times are among the best in the industry. Quorum holds 14 convened board meetings each week in addition to our expedited review staff who are continuously reviewing items during business hours. The number of meetings we offer enables us to have 24-hour turnaround of site documents from receipt of completed submissions to posting approval documents on the portal. 36-hour review cycle for amendments and same-day site changes. In order to streamline site submissions, Quorum offers one-time submission of the CV and audit documentation. Among Quorum's founding principles was the customer experience, and to support that experience today, we have staff available from 8 a.m. to 8 p.m. Eastern Time. Each study with Quorum, regardless of how large it is, will receive its own study manager. Additionally, Quorum offers a secure portal where you can find all of your approval documents. You can also find many different kinds of status reports and our smart form site information questionnaire here. Quorum is aware that there are special needs for phase one and post-marketing studies, and we have special teams and processes for these kinds of studies. We also work with hospitals and institutions and are able to support the unique needs. Finally, we are aware that quality is supremely important to our customers, and we perform a 100% quality check on all documents. Now I'd like to introduce today's expert presenter, Claire Carberry. Claire Carberry joined Quorum Review IRB in September of 2009 as a regulatory attorney. Prior to joining Quorum Review's regulatory department, Ms. Carberry worked as a regulatory analyst and legal intern at Western IRB. Ms. Carberry received her Juris Doctor from Seattle University in 2007 and was admitted to the Washington State Bar Association in the fall of 2007. In addition, Ms. Carberry is a member of the Health and Corporate Law sections of the WSBA. Ms. Carberry passed the Certified IRB Professional Exam and has held her CIP certification since 2010. She currently serves as a member of the Northwest Association for Biomedical Research and Public Responsibility in Medicine and Research. And now I'm going to transition over to Claire. <laughs> 
Okay, great. Thank you so much, Ari, and thank you to all of you that are joining us today. Um, we're really happy that we've picked uh, yet another topic that people are interested in, and I do hope that the presentation today will be valuable to you. Um, I'm just going to give a brief overview of my plan for the discussion today, and then we'll jump in. So I'm going to start talking about legal requirements for collection and use of sample um, in the first part of the talk, and I'm actually going to be covering both U.S. law and Canadian law today. Um, Quorum does research or reviews research in both the U.S. and Canada, and it's um, in. in with respect to this topic in particular, it's, there are some differences between the laws that I think are pretty interesting to note. After that, I'm going to be moving into the second part of the talk. I'll be talking about addressing future research and biobanking in a protocol as well as consent form. And then we'll have a brief discussion at the end of returning of results and incidental findings to study participants that you know information and samples have been used in future research or have been submitted to a biobank. All right, so I'd like to get started here. Um, before we get into the legal analysis that I'll be doing, I wanted to take just a few minutes to frame the issue here. I have a few points on this slide that I think are helpful to identifying why we need to approach biobanks and the future use of samples generally, and the future use of data differently than we need to approach the review of a protocol and consent for a typical interventional trial. First, when you're dealing with samples or genetic information, there's, there's this recognition, I think, an understanding that genetic information is really distinct from other types of health information. And that's in, in a few different ways, with respect to predictability and discriminative power and the scope of that, the information that's gained from analysis of the biological materials is relevant for not just the individuals who provided the materials, but also their family member, and then you know a group of which they may be a part of, potentially. The risks can be hard, hard to quantify and define with when you're looking at biobanking and future research, but it isn't negligible. You know, the risk of informational harm could be quite quite large, and so that is something that is a struggle to explain to people, is a struggle to really even understand what that risk might be, and so we'll talk about how to capture that in a consent form and how to analyze that when you're looking at the use of samples. And then also, you know, just an understanding, I guess adding on to the risk, that the privacy and confidentiality risks that are posed are not just posed by what's been collected and the material and the data that's been collected, but the potential for combining that material with information from other sources and risk of identifiability. We know that that's an issue and it's something that researchers have been able to do in some circumstances, take information from a particular database, combine it with information from other sources and identify individuals. And so we can only assume that, that the ability to do that will grow as technology advances. That's another thing I think that we have to try to address and think about. You know, one of the other reasons that I wanted to talk about this is because it's something that really has been coming up a lot over the last several years um, in the news, and people, you know, see these headlines. I've got some excerpts from papers here about different cases, the research that I just mentioned where researchers were able to identify people just with a little bit of digging online. Of course, you've got the Henrietta Lacks, the book that came out, you know, sort of exposing the research that had been done with her samples and the follow following that and then you know to have a supai case where individuals samples were used in ways that they weren't expecting and how hurtful that was to that tribe and the people that are members of it and that provided samples and it all of these cases are not particularly flattering they don't make the research enterprise really look good and so you know as I mentioned I'll be talking about legal obligations today to get started but I also want us to think about where we might need to go beyond those legal obligations because you'll see there are some quite minimal restrictions in certain types of research that might be conducted and we want to think about an approach that's ultimately going to be acceptable to the public you know it, it may be legal but whether or not it's something that people would think is ethical and acceptable is another question. So I, I'll start in now with the legal requirements for collection and use of samples and data for research, and we'll talk first about U.S. laws and regulations. And I'm going to begin with F the FDA and HH 
US human subjects protection regulations. So these regulations are, you know, fairly old. There have been some minor updates recently, but nothing really substantive. And of course, there's the proposed rule, but we, we're not really sure when that proposed changes to the common rule that would be pretty significant, but it's unclear when those may be coming. So right now we have these regulations about human subjects protection under HHS and FDA that are pretty dated, and they really were designed for studies that are interventional. There's certainly some consent requirements that are relevant, more relevant, I would say, to biobanks and future research than others if you look at what's required to tell people. So procedures is one that could be handled relatively quickly, I think, in a, any sort of biobanking or future research consent form. But when you get into foreseeable risks and confidentiality risks and what you're doing to mitigate the risk to someone's confidentiality, that can be rather complicated. The other thing that we see sometimes is the benefit to the individual in particular is often overstated. And that, that happens in interventional trials as well. We'll get a consent form that really overstates what the possible benefit might be to the individual. But see that a lot in consents for biobank biobanking or just a request to use an individual samples that have already been collected for future research. Certainly there are potential benefits to in individuals maybe with that same disease if you're going to be conducting research about the disease or um, you know potentially lots of individuals if it's really open-ended what type of research will be conducted. But to the individual um, it's important to, to think about how you're presenting that. So as I state here on the slide, I think the challenge lies in fully addressing these elements with respect to banking and future use and thinking a little bit differently about how you address those elements. So the other law I wanted to touch on in the United States is HIPAA. And that certainly is something that we have to be aware of when we're talking about data that's associated with samples or data that's going to be banked. So one of the things I want to note here, and you'll see when we talk about the Canadian regulations that it's different in Canada, but HIPAA applies to limited types of organizations in the United States. It applies to covered entities and business associates. And so a covered entity, as you can see here, is a health plan, a health care clearinghouse, and some health care providers. And a business associate is a person or an entity that performs functions or activities or provides services to a covered entity. So there's lots of organizations, particularly when you're looking at a biobank type of setup, that may not actually be a HIPAA-covered entity or, or a business associate. And so these rules that I'm going to be talking about may, may or may not apply once you've got something in, into a biobank. The HIPAA identifiers I wanted to just go over quickly here. Hopefully this is a refresher for many of you, but I've listed them here, and this is what's called out under the HIPAA privacy rule. So if you're dealing with information about an individual and it has any of this type of data associated with it, it's considered identifiable under HIPAA. And in that case, you would then have to comply with HIPAA, assuming that you're a covered entity or a business associate and subject to HIPAA's requirements. And so I just want to point out some of the things that I think people overlook when they're thinking about whether something is identifiable under HIPAA is bullet three elements of dates, except for a year. So if you're talking about the date, you know, and this is a date that directly relates to an individual. So it could be an admission date, a discharge date, day diagnosis, any of that type of information would make something identifiable. And then Another, I think, that's important to call out is the last identifier here in the list, which is a, any unique identifying number or code, unless it's otherwise permitted by the privacy rule. But if you are dealing with a code or a unique ID number, you want to question whether the information is identifiable under HIPAA and then look at whether HIPAA applies to the research that you're planning to conduct or the banking that um, is planned. And so, there have been a couple of changes to HIPAA that actually specifically relate to a biobank or future research using samples that I wanted to talk about over the next couple of slides. So, and these changes were in 2013. There was a final rule that came out that updated HIPAA and high tech. You might have been aware of the fact that, that it used to be the case that you could, in a HIPAA research authorization, only you couldn't have any reference to what they called unspecified future research 
and that's something that has changed. And then the other thing that has changed is this idea of condition and uncondition. And I'll, I think it's easier to think about this as optional versus not optional. So a conditioned aspect of the research would be, you know, you, if you join this study, we're going to be doing this, this, and this. You would have to take this drug according to the schedule and whatnot. But unconditioned, a lot of times we'll see optional banking activities that are also associated with a study. And so that's what the rule is is um, discussing when they talk about this idea of conditioned and unconditioned authorizations. And there's, there's other things that are unconditioned, like optional sub-studies. But as it relates to biobanks and future research, we're, we're talking about an optional banking that a person could agree to do in addition to their participation in an interventional study. And so it used to be that you would have to have a completely separate authorization describing how you would be getting the samples, the uses, you know, all the elements that need to be included in a HIPAA authorization had to address that unconditioned or the optional piece of the research. And now the stance has changed. And that's something that can be combined in the same consent document. Now, you do have to clearly differentiate. So it still has to be clear to individuals when they're reading this document that while they have to authorize the use and disclosure of their information for the main part of the study, the required part of the study, they have the option to opt not to participate in the banking, to run with our example here. And then the other thing that's important to keep in mind is you have to provide the prospective subject with the opportunity to opt in to the unconditioned research activity. So just want to make sure that's really clear. You can't give them only the option to opt out. It can't be implied that they're agreeing to that optional activity. It has to be a clear affirmative that they are in, you know, agreeing to do that. And so there are a few different ways that that can be set up in the consent form that's combined with an authorization, which is nice. You don't have to necessarily have a complete additional signature. The rule says that there's, there's really flexibility for covered entity and researcher for how they want to set this up. So you could put a checkbox, yes, I agree to be in the study, or an initial line, or a signature line, but there's a few different ways that you could set it up. Okay, and then the other change that I was just mentioning is this is related to the change about specificity in authorizations. And so, as I have here on the slide, HHS reversed its position previously that you'd have to be study specific and couldn't include sort of an open-ended statement in an authorization that, that we'd like to bank your sample and we don't want you to authorize the use of your information for any old research we'd like to do. And so it's not necessarily that you, you could have something incredibly broad. I think, you know, and people and organizations may interpret the new rule differently or more conservatively than others. But I've included the text here. Basically what the rule now says is you can have some open-ended comments about in the authorization about what the sample and information is going to be used for. It just needs to adequately describe the purposes in a way that it would be reasonable for that individual who'd read that form and signed that form to expect that their protected health information could be used or disclosed for the future research that you're intending to do. And so, you know, you have to get specific enough that they could understand, have some understanding of what you're going to be doing. That can still be quite a challenge if you're looking at a biobank and it, it could be absolutely anything. And how do you convey that, I think, is, is certainly challenging. Again, in the rule, the agency says you have flexibility for how to address this in a HIPAA authorization, depending on the nature of the planned research. And so there's not required language that has to be in there. It's really based on what the nature of the planned research is, the banking is, and whatnot. One interesting thing to note is that they've actually put into the rule the sort of retroactive provision where you could rely as a researcher or covered entity on an IRB approved consent form that was obtained prior to the effective date of this rule if it meets this requirement here. So it's adequately describing the purpose of the research such that a person could reasonably understand or expect that their information would be used as you're planning to use it. And so that's potentially helpful if you've got samples that have been collected, individuals consented to the collection of their samples, and they had some information about what was going to be happening kind of as in line with what you are planning at this point. 
a couple of other things that I wanted to touch on in the US before we move on to Canada relate to the requirements for use of de-identified samples. And this is um, where we get to looking at the legal requirements and, and trying to think about whether or not they're enough. And so in the US, the Office for Human Research Protection considers private information or specimens to be individually identifiable when they can be linked to a person. And that's important because you are considered to be doing human subjects research if you're using an individually identifiable information. And so OHRP has a guidance that's cited to here on the bottom of the slide that basically advises if you're using samples that are not individually identifiable, so they have some sort of code, and you as the investigator don't know the identity of the individual and nobody that you're working with knows the identity of the individual, then it's not considered human subjects research. And the impact of that as a researcher using these samples is you, you wouldn't be required under these rules to obtain IRB review. And so there's not necessarily going to be any ethics review requirement of the research that you're doing. Now, that doesn't mean that organizations or biobanks couldn't require you to undergo some sort of ethics review, but under the law, you don't have to have that ethics review. And that's different from Canada, so I'll touch on that when we get there. Another th guidance I thought was just worth pointing out is where we have a more relaxed stance about samples that are left over and not individually identifiable is this FDA guidance about informed consent when you're conducting an IVD study using leftover human specimens. It's a very similar standard here. As long as it's not individually identifiable to the investigator and the samples have not been collected for the purpose of the research, then FDA, while you are still required to get IRB review for the research, you're not required to have consent. And practically, it makes sense. Um, it would be quite challenging if samples aren't individually identifiable to obtain consent. So I think, you know, this is a little bit better middle ground because there's still an ethics review under this guidance. Okay, let's move on to Canada. So the first couple of laws I want to talk about in Canada relate to privacy and are, I guess you would say the equivalent of HIPAA, but they're not, and I'll talk a little bit about why they're not really. So PEPIDA, or the the Personal Information Protection and Electronic Document Act is a law in Canada that applies to personal information that's collected, used, or disclosed by any organization that's engaged in commercial activities. And so that's much broader than HIPAA. As we discussed, HIPAA is limited to applying to a covered entity and business associate. So it's certain types of health-related organizations and organizations that provide services to those health-related organizations, whereas in Canada, there's a law protecting individuals' information and the use and disclosure and applies to every organization engaged in commercial activity. Um, I will note that there are a couple of provinces that have their own provisional statutes that are fairly equivalent to PEPIDA. So, but essentially, across the whole country, you have something that's quite, quite a bit more robust in its application. The organizations that are subject to PEPIDA have to tell people about their intent to collect and use their personal information, and they have to obtain their consent to do so. They have to manage information, um, they're obligated to manage information in a way that safeguards that person's privacy and mitigates the chance that it would fall into the wrong hands. Personal information is, you know, similar to some of the things that are listed in HIPAA, but there's also things like age, height, weight, and so, you know, under HIPAA, those in and of themselves are not identifiers, but under PEPIDA, it's considered personal information. So you could get quite a limited amount of information about an individual and be subject to the PEPIDA requirements. The correlating act that applies to the government in Canada is the Privacy Act, and it applies to most, I think, if not all, of the government departments and agencies. And it limits, again, the collection, use, and per disclosure of personal information, and it gives people the right to access their information, request corrections of their information, and to know how it's been used and shared. So that's interesting to kind of see the difference there. So I'm going to move now into a discussion of the Tri-Council Policy Statement. And this document, if you're not familiar with it, um, even if you're not conducting research in Canada, I would recommend checking it out. It's a really long, it's quite long, um, and it's it's the, basically the 
ethical guideline in Canada for conducting research, um, and it goes into a lot of detail and discussion of a lot of different issues and can be kind of helpful when you're thinking through research involving specific populations or particular types of research. But it is something that is followed in most cases by researchers and organizations that conduct research in Canada, and Quorum follows it in our review of research in Canada. So there is a chapter in the TCPS that discusses human biological materials and what is required when you're collecting them and using them for research. And so there are you know, several things listed here that are considered human biological materials, and it's everything from nail clippings to tissue, urine, saliva. So it um, covers pretty much anything. Now, this is something that I wanted to make sure we note the difference here between the US standard is that in under the TCPS, if your data or your material is used in research, you're considered a participant. And so that's different from, as we were just discussing under that OHARP guidance, you're not a participant if your information is not identifiable or you're not considered a human research subject. And so this is this is a different standard and ultimately that means under the TCPS that at a minimum there's a research ethics board, REV review, in Canada, where as in the US there's some types of research that wouldn't necessarily require that under the law. So one of the things I wanted to touch on here, and I think these are really helpful for thinking about how you should consent people for future research and biobanking in particular, you know, if you want to think about how to go above and beyond the minimum requirements and really give them a fully informed way to make a decision. And so I wanted to just go through the things that are required under the TCBS for consent when you're using samples. You have to describe the type and amount of materials that would be taken, the manner in which they will be taken. So this and, and that should include a description of the safety and invasiveness of the procedures that you're going to be using to acquire the materials, the intended use, and that would include any commercial use, the measures that are employed to protect the privacy of individuals and minimize risks to them, the length of time that materials will be kept, how they're going to be preserved, location of storage, process for disposal, um, and then the last couple here, if there's a link and um, a description of that between the materials and the information about participants. And then finally, this issue of handling results and findings that may be clinically relevant and, and what's the plan for that, and informing individuals at the outset what you would do in that circumstance. Okay, so similarly to in the US, under the rules that we were discussing. If you haven't obtained consent from an individual in Canada under the TCPS and you would like to undergo a secondary use of materials, there's a way to do that, but it does still require REB review. And so there's certain things that the research ethics board needs to evaluate. And you'll see that some of this lines up a little bit with the criteria for a waiver of consent. So if an IRB were reviewing the secondary use of samples and a researcher didn't want to get consent for that, they would likely also be reviewing in the US a waiver of consent request. And so this kind of looks at those aspects and, and I think goes a little bit above and beyond that as well. So they, they need to find that the materials are essential to the research it wouldn't affect anybody adversely that's provided samples, the research wouldn't, the use of those samples wouldn't, that, they're, that the researchers are taking appropriate measures to protect privacy and safeguard the materials, they're going to comply with any preferences that might have been expressed by individuals about the use of their samples. And then, again, here's some things that are sort of similar to the waiver of consent, that it's impossible or impractical to seek consent from individuals. And that, finally, if they've got any other necessary permission to, for the secondary use that's needed, that they've obtained that. Okay. So that concludes the discussion of the legal requirements in the U.S. and Canada and moves us into this discussion of addressing future research in biobanking in the protocol as well as the consent.
so the first thing I copied here, I pasted this. You can see it's pretty old. It's um, from 1997, and it's from OPRR, which is the predecessor agency to OHARP. Um, and it's a diagram that was that was published and put out as sort of a guidance to to for IRBs and I think researchers as well to think about when in sort of the process of collecting samples, having some a repository and, and then using those samples for research, you may need IRB review, you might need informed consent, and what other types of things you might need. And so I think, um, you know, it's not necessarily reflective of how biobanks or future research really work because you could, you're probably getting things from, it might, might be a more circular type of diagram. So you're getting things coming in at all different times from all different sort of sources, potentially, and then, um, again, the recipients, you know, might be coming from any number of things, and they might get different types of access depending on, you know, what types of agreements are in place and whatnot. And so, ultimately, you can see that the agency expectation at that point in time, and I think, you know, this is still something that's out there and available, so it's not that they retracted it, is that there's IRB review of the repository as well as the process for obtaining samples. And I think it's fair to say that any time that you're looking at a future research scenario, biobanking plan, or bio, setting up a biobank, you need to think about sort of these three parts of that make that up. And so the first is the tissue collection, uh, the sample collection, and the data collection, and how that's being collected, where it's coming from, the source, what purpose was it originally collected for? Is it being collected specifically to be placed in a repository or a biobank, or is it left over? Maybe the biobank is composed of both types of samples. And then, of course, there's the consent piece and whether there was IRB review. And if things are left over, you know, from an existing study, from a previous study, then yeah, there might have been IRB review. There may not have been IRB review or consent that related to banking of samples. And if things are from just clinical care and leftover, you have a clinical care consent potentially, but not anything that's IRB reviewed. So there's lots of different ways that things come in that may or may not have had you know, different levels. They've had different levels of oversight, I guess I would say. And then the second piece is this repository storage, the storage of the sample, the banking, that may be something that samples are kept for a very long time and samples and data are housed and multiple investigators can access them. Or it might be, you know, we've seen things at Quorum where we've reviewed a biobank, you could call it, but it's really more of a, you know, they're acting as an intermediary helping researchers get samples and it's more, they're more of a pass-through than, than actually a bank that's storing samples for any length of time. And then the last piece of trying to understand the whole flow of taking samples and then giving them to researchers is the part where you're giving to researchers and how investigators are gaining access, who they might be, and what the requirements are there. We as an IRB are trying to look at, asked to look at a biobank. We want to see all of those three sort of pieces of, of the pie, if you will. You know, we've seen in the U.S., if you have de-identified samples, that you might be able to do research without IRB review, um, whereas in Canada, it doesn't matter. Um, any use of samples requires IRB review. And this, this can present a challenge in the U.S., I think, to IRBs, because if they are reviewing a protocol that indicates there might be some future research with samples, you know, I think they have to ask, well, how far do they go to really ask about that research? Because it's possible that it doesn't even require IRB oversight. In the event, and, and I think what I want to kind of switch to here is talking about when we actually are asked to look at a biobank um, and what that IRB review looks like. And so, as I was discussing on the previous slides, some of the things that we want to have an understanding of is how materials are entered into the bank, what are the conditions under which a researcher can get access to materials in the bank? You know, are they required to get an IRB review? Maybe it's not legally required, but what does the biobank require of individuals to 
get access to the materials. And then, the, you know, there's a lot of issues that we want to have an understanding of related to the information that's collected in stores and access rights, confidentiality, data security and protection, how things are coded, what is made available, and so on. One of the things that we see rather frequently, I would say, we get questions about pretty frequently, is this, um, this situation where there's been a consent obtained from individuals um, that were involved in research, and the researcher wants to know, hey, there's some additional samples that were left over, we weren't anticipating this at the time, but I'd really like to use them for this particular project, can I do that based on the consent that was obtained? So as an IRB, we look at, you know, we first look at whether the language or the context of the consent form indicate that that person was interested in aiding the type of research that was being proposed. And so when people talk about this, I think there's a general acceptance that, yeah, if the person was involved, you know, they have diabetes, they were involved in a study that's about diabetes and, you know, it's likely that they want to further research in this area and they would be supportive of that happening and it's sort of within the scope of their consent, depending on what was included in the consent form, of course. But it gets challenging when that's not the case and you're trying to do something that's really well beyond the scope of the consent that they initially signed. So, you know, we try to look at whether the consent is adequate for the type of research that's being planned you know, the circumstances in which something was was collected certainly make a difference because you might not even have a consent form if it was something where the sample has is just left over from clinical care. In the event that the consent form doesn't cover the research that's planned, that doesn't mean that you couldn't obtain a waiver of consent. It's just that that's another step that ultimately you would have to go through in order to proceed with the research. And so that's really the alternative option there if the consent form didn't address the research that's planned at this point in time. So I want to talk a little bit about consenting to future research next. You know, I have a quote here, and this is from a book. You know, in the typical ICF for research, they say it's possible to inform individuals about the exact nature and the purpose of the research project in a lot of detail. but in the context of research biobanking, it's really hard to get specific because the research that's performed on banked material is by nature open-ended. And so it can be really practically challenging to ask permission for individuals specifically in a consent form. And then the other point here is I think, you know, it's practically challenging, at least at this point in time, to insist or require that permission be asked throughout you know, for, for each individual research project. And I've certainly seen things that people seem to be promoting out there, like an app where an individual would be, um, you know, prompted to log in and find out a little bit about a study, and then they could say yay or nay. And, I, you know, those are interesting, and that's interesting to think about. I don't think that we're there yet. <laughs> and so I think we have to think about, can we be okay with having a more open-ended consent? I'll just say, I think that that's, that is okay. I think, you know, you have to explain to people just how open-ended it is, and trying to find a way to do that can be challenging. Um, one of the things that I've developed in conjunction with this presentation, and Ari will mention it at the end here, is I found several resources as I was working on this presentation where there's, a, there's folks out there that have developed consent templates for biobanks, and I think that they have done a really great job of coming up with language that helps to describe how, you know, the risk, um, the open-endedness of research with respect to a biobank. As far as the concept of future research and explaining that with respect to another study, I think it's important to think about the consent approach. Um, a lot of times what we'll see is a very short sort of statement at the end of a consent form for a study, and of course that consent form might be 20-something pages that's sort of a, by the way, we would also like to bank your sample for future research, and that's the end of it. I think it's worth thinking about whether that can be kept separate and whether it's really reasonable or appropriate to ask people in one sentence whether they're willing to do that. I think it's reasonable to think about obtaining that consent at a later date and separating it from the main consent so that 
you, you know, individuals really have the time and enough information to consider whether they're willing to be a part of that. As far as explaining the concept of a biobank, I've put some points here that, that again, you know, this is from my experience at Quorum and reviewing biobanks, but I think this will be helpful for folks that are developing a consent form to think about what are the kinds of things that we should be included, and it's maybe a bit above and beyond what is minimally required, but I think it's worth thinking about, again, how, do you, how can you really inform people about what you're asking them to do? And so focusing on the fact that the future research is really maybe unspecified and open-endedness, as I've been mentioning, I think is important. Discussion of the length of time for storage, a lot of times it's indefinite, and I, I think that's okay to say that, but it's better to say that than nothing at all about the length of time of storage. So we get a lot of clients that have asked us to review something related to future research or biobanking, and they say, well, we don't know how long we're going to use our sample. We're going to use it until we use it up, you know, and that's okay to say. It's, I think you need to say it. Confidentiality and privacy is a big one and certainly actually a legal requirement to address in the consent form. So talking about, you know, not just, you know, kind of an, a statement that's really sort of bland or ambiguous, we see those a lot where sort of confidentiality of your information will be maintained. I ideally would like to see a little more information about how, how they protect people's information and if it's coded or who has access to that, that that information be provided. Um, you know, if a sample is being sent outside of the biobank, what types of information would accompany it? And, and getting a little bit more into detail so people really understand what what's going to happen with their sample and their information. Sometimes we'll see, you know, requests for future research or a biobank where they're also requesting access to an individual's medical record. They have a particular condition, they'd like to follow them, so that certainly has to be addressed and it may be that you need to mention that in the consent form, but a lot of times, keep in mind, you'll also have to have them sign a release. The consent form often is not accepted by uh, medical practice and so we'll have researchers coming back to us and say, well, they won't accept the consent form. Well, the individual's going to have to sign the release of that organization has developed before they are willing to release records. And so you might want to give them notice as part of the consent process that, that they may be asked to sign some other documents about that. Contacting for future research, if that is part of the plan, as I mentioned, I think that that's probably unrealistic at, at this point in time, though certainly I think some people are thinking about how they could build that in. If it is built into the biobank that you're working on or the future research plans that you have, you know, you need to tell people that they would be contacted and ideally let them opt out of that because it, you know, it's quite burdensome potentially if they're being contacted over and over. So, you know, this relates kind of to confidentiality and privacy, but the scope of sharing between entities I think is important to cover. And, you know, who are the investigators? A lot of times I don't think that's covered at all, you know, so the, a person might think that, oh, I'm submitting, I'm providing my sample or my information to this entity and they don't really have an understanding that it's not just this entity that's going to be doing research with the city. So giving them a better idea of how a biobank actually works I think is helpful. In addition to identifying people, giving an idea of how they will gain access to the information. Do they have to have a review by an ethics board before they do that? Does the biobank decide based on their project, you know, the merits of their project? Um, can anybody get access to certain information? So that's that's important and it goes back to confidentiality and privacy as well, I think. Development of commercial products is a big one that I think is impor really important to address, especially with this type of research and actually confidentiality is already on there, so that's a redundancy there. It, it, access to results, and I'll talk a little bit more about this in the next couple of slides, is something, you know, or incidental findings that might, um, that a researcher might come across, I think, Discussing with individuals the plan for contacting them if something like that happens is important in the consent form. And then finally, the ability to withdraw a sample or information. Um, a lot of times there isn't any ability to do that because once something's been shared, it's, you know, the biobank doesn't have necessarily the ability to unshare that. And But that needs to be communicated. Again, a lot of times when there isn't an ability to withdraw, it's just silent, and I think it's better to explain that, that 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 isn't a possibility than to be silent on the matter. 
Um, one thing I did want to just touch on, I think this is really was really interesting to me, um, something that I came across is a study, and I've linked to a presentation about the study that was done, That's that the slides are really helpful, and there's some really interesting graphs to take a look at, but it was a study involving individuals that would have been participants, IRB members, and investigators, and they were asked to review a biobanking form that the researchers had developed. And they just asked the individuals, go ahead and go through this form and highlight information that you think is important. And maybe not surprisingly, you know, the IRB members really highlighted a lot more heavily than any of the other folks that were involved in the study. And so I think it's really important to keep in mind, and that's one of the reasons I wanted to share that resources sheet that I developed, because there's some consent templates, there's some literature in there about what, you know, you know people have done research about what people think is important to them as part of the consent process. You know, we certainly have an obligation as an ethics review board to make sure that we're meeting our legal obligations, but we should also have an understanding of if there's literature out there about what people say they want to know <laughs> about, um, you know, research that's happening and, and not base it entirely on, you know, somewhat dated, especially in the U.S. our HHS and FDA regulations, regulatory requirements. So I think it's great if we can go above and beyond that and think a little bit more about tailoring the consents to this type of research as well. Okay, and so quickly I'm going to talk about this last issue of return of results or incidental findings to study participants, excuse me. And so this is a, this is certainly a kind of a hot topic, I think, whenever we discuss it within staff and with our board members here, um, you know, people have differences of opinion that can be quite significant. There are a few things I think that are really important to think about when determining when to return results. Ideally, especially if you're working on a biobank type of project, you're thinking about this as you're getting the biobank set up. So before you're ever running across a researcher contacting you and saying, you know, I was doing this research and I found something concerning about this sample and I'd like to let you know, you may need to reach out to this person. These questions and these this thought process that I'll be kind of talking about over the next couple of slides, I think, should be part of a process that's already laid out and made available to the people that would be decision makers ultimately when they come across this type of information. So first is, you know, it's really important to think about the potential that results are inaccurate. Um, you know, how how did the how are the results obtained? If there's any way possible to retest prior to returning results or contacting an individual, um, obviously that can be a problem depending on how much of a sample or the quality of the sample. And then this issue of what can the results tell an individual about their health. We'll talk a little more about the things I think that can be positive and negative about getting information. I hear this statement that's made a lot with respect to return of results that I'd like to just bring up because I don't agree with it. And it is that, well, we should only tell people information about their health, the incidental findings that are clinically relevant, if there's something that they can medically do about the information. So, you know, if there's something that indicates that they have a higher risk of getting some sort of disease or condition, it's, there's no point in telling them if there's no treatment available for it or if there's nothing they can do medically. And I don't think that that's true. I think, you know, people can do a lot of things, whether they're not whether they're doing something medically to prepare themselves, to prepare their family, to um, arrange their lives, you know, in the event that, that they do develop this disease, you know, if they're at higher risk for it. So I think it's important to think through some other things, you know, certainly the negative impact of return of results, and then, it, you know, I'll have a slide that follows us that talks about the positive impact, but thinking about negative impact and, and then the ways to mitigate that are really important. And so, you know, one of the first things that comes up when we when we talk about this is, you know, people can be very upset by getting this type of information if they especially, you know, they're not expecting to hear anything about this and then all of a sudden they they could be really blindsided. And so, you know, it can cause a lot of anxiety and depression and stress to the person, to their family, could mean something to the family member. And so, and we don't really know, you know, that individual may or may not share that. You don't have a lot of control. They could try to pursue procedures or treatments that are risky or really expensive but don't offer a lot of benefit. And so I think, you know, one way to mitigate 
all of these negative impacts is to give an individual access to a genetics counselor and healthcare professionals that can help them to understand what this means. And so that's, I think, something to think really seriously about. If you do have plans to return results, what are you going to do to support this person? Positive impacts of return of results, like I said, I don't think that it should be, you know, the analysis should be limited to whether they can medically address the issue, you know, there's lots of things that people could do. There's triggers or substances that are likely in a lot of cases to increase the chance of developing a disease or condition, and so that's something that people could avoid, you know, that they might not have otherwise. There's lots of planning that can happen um, financially, um, healthcare power of attorney, so tools like that that could be put in place if an individual, you know, is given this information. And then you know, there could be treatments or preventative action that could be taken ultimately, or it could become available later. And so, you know, cutting a person off from information because something isn't available now, you run the risk of potentially them not being able to avail themselves of something down the line. So, you know, the addressing of return of results and consent is something that I mentioned a few slides back, I think is important. We see a few different approaches to this. You know, there's this kind of opt out. You can say you don't want to be contacted, and I, I like, I prefer in line with the HIPAA regulations that we were talking about, more of an opt-in so that people affirmatively are saying that they would like to be contacted. We see sometimes a, an attempt to do a tiered consent approach where people say, well, if this is a circumstance, then I'd like to be notified, but if this is a circumstance, then no, or they have the option to say yes or no to different fact patterns that you present. And I think that that can be complicated because you may get results that don't fit in these nice little boxes that you designed when you were first designing a consent form. And so I think a sort of yay or nay approach is probably preferable. And then, you know, there's just the all or nothing that, you know, our plan is to return anything that we deem to be clinically relevant or we wouldn't be returning anything in any case. And so I think those are policies that you have to think about. None is necessarily bad or good, but individuals will know at least what the policy is when they agree to be a part of the research. And that actually concludes my discussion today. I thank you all for tuning in. I hope this was helpful, and I'm going to turn it over to Ari. I want to thank you, Claire, for preparing and presenting the information on this very relevant topic. I'd like to also let our viewers know that if they have additional questions, there is an opportunity opportunity still to submit questions via our survey at the end of the webinar. Alternatively, you can email your questions to clientrelations at quorumreview.com. We'll be doing our best to follow up individually uh, to your questions within 30 days. Um, and then I'd also like to remind you about follow-up um, and any sort of reminders that will be occurring afterwards. The recording, the slide deck, the attendance certificate, and a special resource document that Claire referenced will be posted on our website within five business days. We will be emailing those links out to you so uh, you'll know when they're available. We do value your opinion. This is another plug for the survey that will occur, so don't close your browser down. Just go ahead and once the recording stops, uh, keep your browser open and the survey will open up. It, helps, it does help us determine what kinds of um, topics to offer in the future. And finally, once again, we here at Quorum are thanking you for attending this webinar. We hope you found the topic informative and useful. If you're interested in learning more about Quorum, please visit us at www.quorumreview.com. You can also find us on the following social media outlets, Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, YouTube, Google+, and SlideShare. And with that, I will thank you for your time and hope you have a good afternoon. <laughs>